Hi, I'm Chris Coven. I'm the founder of In the House. We're a community for general counsel and other in-house counsel to gather, uh, share best practices, and, and build community. And this is an interesting time for us because we've been a um, advocate for, um, I guess, remote meetings for quite some time. And now we're all working remotely pretty much, all of us that are knowledge workers like lawyers and others. Um, and um, so it's an interesting time. And just a couple quick observations I'd like to share. Number one is, I think this is a really a, um, a good time to look for silver linings in our lives, both our personal lives and our professional lives. And I really think that um, this is an interesting time for innovative general counsel to demonstrate their leadership. I think it's been well established, if you, especially if you're a history buff like I am, times of crisis are times when uh, current leader, leaders are tested and um, new leaders are made. And I think this is one such time. So as awful as the situation is, I think what general counsel need to be thinking about is how can I either prove my leadership skills now by showing that I am innovative and I can be an effective leader from this strange work from home environment. And if you're a would be general counsel, this is a good time to step up and show your leadership. And it's also a good time to think about how can I plan the next stage in my career? Because if you can be an effective, innovative general counsel in a small company, it might be a good time to broaden your ambitions and think, well, if I can lead in this environment, maybe I can lead in, in a larger environment if that's my goal. So, um, but without further ado, I want to introduce the co-host of GC Casual Friday, David Slater. So we're here every Friday at noon Eastern time. And I'd love to introduce our guest today, uh, Sonia Sigler. And Sonia will tell you a little bit more about her background, but she has a, a long background as an in-house lawyer and also as an executive coach, among many other uh, talents and attributes. And she's going to be sharing some of her insights that she's gained throughout her career, um, especially about the topic of um, how do we make uh, legal de departments function well in this work from home environment. So uh, Sonia, um, I'd just like you to invite you to sort of uh, uh, provide us a little bit about your background and what you've, uh, about your career and what you're working on currently. And then we can um, be happy to share your presentation with the group. Great, thank you, Chris. Appreciate you having me on today. It's such an important topic. Um, I'm a long time in-house lawyer and I've turned on Terminator and I was in-house at companies like Sega and Intuit to start my career. And then about 20 years ago, I left Intuit to go in-house, I mean, uh, to startups and I've been with startups ever since. So made that transition to the business side and I've held dual roles pretty much the rest of the rest of my career in operations and business development. And that perspective, I think, in terms of running a business and, and um, being on the legal side and the business side has given me a really um, unique perspective and, and really kind of how to grow the business and, and sustain it. And two of those startups were started in recessions. So I've mm -hmm. um, got good experience um, coming through crazy things like this. And then the other part I would say is... Um, working with leaders, half of whom were engineers and half of whom were lawyers. So it's really interesting to see those leadership skills uh, and how different they are in those different kinds of um, um, expertise. So I started my own company a couple of years ago to be able to help people directly. So to build better leaders. So the executive coaching that I do is really to work with the team's leader and uh, company leaders. So CEOs, entrepreneurs, general counsels, for them to really hone their leadership skills and, and become the leader they want to be. So I'm really thrilled to be able to do that kind of work. And now what's happened over the last two or three weeks is that it's morphed into how do I even survive with my department now? And how, right. how can I keep things going when, uh, you know, thing, the world is falling around, you know, down around our ears. And at the same time, the work still has to get done. We still have right. to, be people first, which I'll talk about, but also just how can we keep keep things going? So, 
you know, I've heard, you know, that they just want their, you know, effective and productive departments back. Right. And it's frustrating because, um, you know, not everybody is in the same kind of situation. We're kind of in a new era and really unprecedented times, at least in most of our lifetimes, um, for this kind of um, crisis to happen. And not just um, happening, but all over from a global perspective. So, um, you know, we've become much more of a global workforce um, and we've, you know, transition to a lot of remote workers, but lawyers were not one of them. Um, so now that everyone is working from home or we're forced to, it's, it's really showing that you have to step up and be a leader. You can't just leave a leadership void, which I see happening in some places. So I'll talk a little right. bit about that. So very interesting. You want to share the slides, we can go ahead and, and get started. Yes. I want to encourage people to ask questions, either put it in the chat room or just um, take yourself off a of mute and, and ask your question because I'd rather answer things as we go along than forget, you know, not have time at the end. Yes, definitely. And what I'll do is periodically we can, I can unmute all because we do have some dial in folks. And um, while there's only four appearing on the video, at least on my view of the video, there's a whole bunch of people in the background. So uh, we're, we've got you folks in mind and we'll keep an eye on the chat window. And I will also unmute a few times throughout the, uh, throughout the hour so that we can hear from everybody or give everyone an opportunity to speak. Great. And Chris, you wanna go ahead and share the slides? Oh, uh, I think I did. Are you seeing them? You should be seeing slide one now. Yep. Okay. See it. Oh, you know what? Hold on just a second. Let me go right <laughs> okay. to one view. <laughs> okay. I had to move the other screen. Yeah, it happens. We're, we're all learning for, as we go. So. Here is what's happening. <laughs> yep. Okay. Let me do that. Great. Cool. So you can go up one side and we'll talk about really embracing remote work and how we can make working from home a success. Some people do it better than others, and that's true whether we're in a crisis or not. So the components to taking back your department um, and making it efficient and productive again under the current situation is really simple. It's embracing remote work, and it's really learning how to manage a remote team. So those two components um, are, are really the, the simple answer to this problem. In terms of embracing the remote work itself, we're going to talk about the tools and equipment and support, just kind of the price of admission. We're going to talk about the myth versus reality and what's going on. We'll talk about you and your team, and then we'll talk about what makes managing a remote team a success. And it really boils down to three things, putting people first, good communication, and continued uh, accountability. So we'll chat about what's not working because I hear a lot about that. And then we really get an opportunity here to figure out what the new normal is. And that's, I think, really an exciting opportunity for everyone. So I'm, I'm kind of thrilled about that. Um, go ahead and forward one slide. So the, these pictures that I've included are almost all mine. So that is my office, <laughs> or that has mm -hmm. been my office. I just moved and I have been roving from room to room to find a good spot. And that was my office for about two weeks. <laughs> I now have an actual desk, but um, this is what's happening for your team. <laughs> People are working at the kitchen table. They're working at a desk in their kid's playroom. They are working, you know, uh, on a TV tray in their bedroom. So this is just to give you a heads up that this is what's going on with, with people on your team. So I want to start with just the basics. This is the price of admission, making sure everyone has the tools and the equipment and the support they need to make this remote work situation effective and productive. I mean, if your desk is in your kid's playroom, you're going to have a certain level of productivity, and that's not what you're used to. I, um, so, so um, take it with a grain of salt that this is the ideal setup and, and all these components of having dual monitors and, and printers that can do high speed printing. Um, I know a lot of lawyers like to print things out and read them and I'm seeing, you know, I need to print something out because I'm going to read it while my kids are playing outside um, and I can still be out there with them. So there's some things like that that um, keep coming up, like printers and dual monitors are the two things that I'm 
hearing have been kind of issues. And, and I highlighted the other one, connectivity. I think bandwidth is a huge issue. People, when you have five people or six people or however many people you have in your household all online at the same time, your connectivity and your bandwidth is, is gonna degrade. So those issues are kind of the top three. Access and security, so getting, you know, whether you're VPN, you know, into a network or however you're accessing it, those all still have to happen. I know IT guys are working 18, 20 hours a day trying to keep everybody up and running, and they, you know, they deserve kudos right now because they have a thankless job. They're one of those jobs like legal where you don't want to know about them. <laughs> they right. happen seamlessly in the background. And I'm seeing IT just, you know, worked to the bone right now. I've What's good news about that is I've seen departments who said we want to set people up for working from home. And so some of this was in place before, but now it's in place for 100% of your team. So that's a good thing. And we'll talk about what that means for the future. Um, um, can I, uh, let me ask just a quick, I have a comment and a quick question on this yeah. and then um, invite anyone else to ask questions, obviously. So, so one comment is, and, and I think that the details are really important, right? And I see that in your image, you have a really looks like a very high quality office chair. And mm -hmm. I do too. I have like a Herman Miller office chair at home that supports my back and all that kind of stuff. So I feel like we're spending more time than ever in front of screens. And I think that's hugely important. So I just wanted to note that. So get, you know, there's a lot of uh, websites. I think one of them's like sit for less and there's some other ones out there. We can get very high quality chairs i really recommend that you go out and you know get not go out but order one online and and get a high quality office chair so uh yeah especially those of us of a certain age it really helps to have a yeah chair. and i find that sitting all day long so the reason i drove around my house is because i have another office set up upstairs that i have a um uh it's a bigger desk table that raises and lowers and so you just push the button and it'll raise up and you can stand so then I can stand um, at that particular desk but I find that sitting all day long I just like it's it, it's, it's hard, really hard. Yes. I also have a ball that I sit on so well, but then I end up doing this you know you're kind of <laughs> right. the whole time. so I try not to do that on video calls <laughs> that's prob probably a, a, a good call. Now, my question is, um, should the legal department be paying um, out of pocket for people to, for the in-house lawyers to have uh, secure connections at home? And what, what role, and, and I'm sure it varies by legal department, but do you have any views on whether the legal department should be essentially creating a work from home kit at the company expense for its in-house lawyers? Yeah, I think that's really important because they wouldn't be working at home if they didn't have that particular job. Um, if they were consulting, they would do it on their own dime. But it, since it's the job for that legal department and company, I totally think that that is a good idea. When I was at Intuit and we were working at home, um, most everybody at least one day a week, and then you could choose whether you wanted to do a second day, depending on which clients you supported and where they were. Like if they were on the East Coast, it might make sense to stay at home. Uh, in the mornings and then come in later. Um, so you had to have a secure setup. Um, they put in a, at the time, an ISDN line, and then they put in a high speed um, line when that became available. They, I actually replicated my system at work at home. So the phone that I had had the automatic arm that would come up when I answer a call, I had the headset. Um, that was wireless that could go up to 200 feet. So it was all the same setup I had in my office. They replicated at home. So that was really great. And they did foot the bill for that. Yeah, I'm glad to hear same that view. Of your... Yeah, same thing I... with the keyboard and the monitor. So that was really helpful. That's good to hear. I, I, I totally share that view because um, I think that one thing I've been trying to emphasize when I speak to people over the last few weeks is these are the things we're going to be talking about for the rest of our lives because we're in a crisis. Just like, you know, I remember 9 11 because I was close to that and lived in the area. Um, you know, these are the, we'll be, you know, 20 years from now, people will be remembering my legal department stepped up and mm -hmm. got me really set up to work comfortably from home. So yeah. it's 
hugely important. So I'm, I'm telling every GC that will listen to me, think about that. Think about allocating budget to help your people get them set up properly to work from home. Yeah, you're not going to be paying for conferences. You're going to be paying for chairs and monitors. And you're not paying for uh, airplane tickets travel. and travel yeah. and all that. So use some yeah. of that money to support your people. Yeah. So, right. Absolutely. I'm glad you agree with me. And that's, that reflects, I think, a GC's leadership that they're pushing for their people. And Don't wait them. to be asked, you know, right. make the offer. I think it's super important for that support to be there. I, I couldn't include all the pictures that I have, I have shared on the internet, um, on Facebook and a couple other places because I didn't have permission. So that's why I included my own pictures here. Got it. But there are pictures of people literally with a TV tray sitting next to between their bed and the and the sliding glass door and that's their office so if you want productivity to be high make an offer to get them a chair that they are not going to you know have back problems you know and and working at home one to two days a week the couch is fine the bed is fine the kitchen table is fine but when you're doing this all the time it's not fine any longer the chair the desk the monitor the height all of that you know all of that setup needs to be um, looked at and, and ask your team for an audit. Like, how are you working at home? Um, and see what they need. That, I mean, that proactive leadership is super important. And David, you asked, what are some of the lessons or principles that you teach your clients regarding leadership? And the proactiveness, and I'll get to this um, when we talk about what to do. Proactive, being proactive leader is one of those things that you have to step up. Um, lead your people. You know what? You're the head honcho. The buck stops with you. I think being an authentic leader, so not just proactive, but authentic, saying when you don't know, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what is going to go on with our budget. I've had people who are like, oh my gosh, our entire legal department just got furloughed because we're in hospitality. Um, so, and they didn't see it coming or they didn't have any notice of it so it just happened like it she this woman had been working from you know one to five in the morning because that's when her kids were asleep and she got a notice at you know 5 15 that they were all being furloughed and it's like okay that had to have been in the works or at least discussed so let people know what's going on so stepping up and being proactive being authentic about what's going on, I think is really important. And that it's new, it's different, it's hard. We're all in this together, we'll figure it out. Um, coming through a shared trauma, because that's what this is, is a shared trauma, there's gonna be a newfound respect for people who step up and be, be you know, proactive leaders. Do you find since you that? A, a related question is, you work with both CEOs and GCs and other C-suite folks. So do you see a difference? So the legal profession, a great thing about lawyers is we're common a crisis. So that's good right now. Maybe not such a good thing is the profession has traditionally been reactive. In other words, we're presented with a challenge and then we go and we think about it and then we, we provide our advice. So right yeah. by definition, reactive almost. So do you find it different in teaching GCs to be proactive? Does that, is that more of a challenge? And what are some of the tips and techniques that might apply now? I think it's profoundly uncomfortable for a lot of GCs to be proactive because they are used to being reactive. They're used to coming in, solving a problem. They're used to being the calm, you know, shelter in a storm. And that is one of the things that I most noticed in the, the lawyers and the GCs and the legal side of leadership that I've seen over the years it, is that they are come in, let's assess the situation, let's figure it out, let's make a plan and move forward and, and handle the crisis. So Sonia, can I just add on that then? This is actually the perfect time for them to shine because we are in a crisis, we need leadership. And so what you were saying earlier, I think this is the time for them to step up to say, okay, this is what's happening, here's a plan, let's work this through and we can get it, you know, whatever needs to be done, even like the group that got furloughed. Because I yeah. think that is what people want to know, that there's a leader in charge who knows how, where we need to go. Yeah, I think you can see this playing out. So in the governors, so we have 50 governors plus our territories and leaders in those, plus our president, plus, plus our Congress and, and Senate. You can see in action every single day who's being proactive and who is like, I don't know what to do, I'm just gonna be quiet or I'm gonna say something stupid and put my foot in my mouth. You can see that leadership in action yep. and you can see it all over the place. I think 
the governor of Washington. So I, I moved to the state of Washington in January. The governor here has been super proactive because the first case here in the United States was in Seattle. So he has stepped up, he has put um, quarantine in place early on, and then you see the opposite end, the governor of Florida, the governor of Georgia, who are like, oh, I didn't even know viruses spread by, you know, <laughs> by, Washington yeah, that so came out yesterday. Oh, I just found out 24 hours ago. It's like, yeah. really? It's a, it's a revelation. And how did you get elected? Okay. <laughs> but that shows you the leadership void versus the proactive and stepping it up. So if you need a role model, just look left or right and you can see good ones, you know, all over the place. So getting people the right equipment, getting the right setup is, is one of those easy areas to be proactive and to be be a human, be concerned about your team. Um, let's go to the next one, because the next slide, because yeah, this sure. is really where. Can I, can I just ask you about dual monitors? Uh -huh. Like how how does how does dual monitors work, or how are they deployed? Um, you mean just like physically? Like how does like it work? I, I'm used to dealing with one monitor. I'm just curious how I, I could work with two monitors or how you oh. see people doing that. Is it I'm, one monitor for kind of in, interactive Zoom calls and the other one for doing, uh, lead, you know, work? Uh, is, it depends is on how you like to work, David. So for me, I just switched to dual monitors maybe, um, I don't know, 18 months ago because I'm like, I'm not super dyslexic, but like when you try to move things from one monitor to the other, I, it has to be in the right order. So you need to play around with how things appear on the screen. Um, I have a laptop and I have a large monitor and then um, I can put things that I wanna edit in front of me and then keep other things like email to this to, on the other screen so that it's not mm -hmm. distracting to me. I see a lot of it in doc review where they'll have your coding page on one and the documents you're reviewing on the other. So then you can click through the documents quickly and at the same time, keep your coding panel up. Um, so it just depends on how you want to work and how much real estate you want. Like if you're fine editing documents on a laptop, you probably don't need dual monitors. If you need mm -hmm. more real estate, because I, I tend to like everything printed out in front of me, but that's not tenable any longer. So I put multiple things on the screens if I'm editing and, and like I just wrote a book and published it last year. So having all those versions and comments up was helpful to see on a dual to monitor. Yeah, and a lower tech version, by the way, which is what I do is I have a 40 inch monitor. It's a high resolution. So I can have, I could even have like a Word document, an Excel sheet, and then a Zoom conference all on the screen comfortably at the same time. And that's a, it's not dual, but it might as well be because it's basically yeah, this Yeah, because size. you have so much real estate. That's exactly. what I have in front of me. So that's why I said I couldn't see you because I put that one window behind you. <laughs> right. I, like, exactly. I don't see the slides. <laughs> so Sonia, can I ask you another question? When you said well, this yeah. is the time that shows you where leaders step up. Mm -hmm. So because also the thing is you're going to find some of the leaders aren't what you need at this time so what do you sort of advise your ceos or the gcs to actually do when they realize that you know it's very easy for every the same thing right they say when when the things are going well it's very easy for everybody to look good but yeah. it's when the stuff is when the market's going down that's when you know who you want to have with you fighting with you exactly and i saw this firsthand at sega so we rode the high uh uh, and became one of the largest companies in the world. And, and at the same time, we were experiencing lumpy revenue. So we had layoffs and I ended up getting laid off there. And you see on the way down who the real leaders are and who the great communicators are. Um, so this is an opportunity to step up, to be a better leader, to, to be authentic. And I think the other thing is transparency. And we'll talk about that more a couple slides down when we talk about the communication. But I think this is a golden opportunity that we don't get very often. And I want to address one thing you brought up, Chris, about CEOs and lawyers um, and how, how they're different. <clears throat> CEOs are used to being proactive and out in front of everyone because that's the role. Lawyers aren't necessarily used to that. And I think being forward thinking right now is an asset and just consider it 
moving your legal department into the future, this is the opportunity to do it now. But now you can say, what do I want it to look like? If everyone's going to work remotely, right. what do I want it to look like? And, and give it some thought. It's moving from the, the reactive operational to the strategic and proactive. And I think that alone, if we say anything that sticks today, it's moving to the strategic and proactive level um, as, a, as a lawyer and leader of a legal department, because you are a business asset as a legal department, whether your company knows it or not, um, and keeping the wheels on the bus, you know, so to speak, that that, that is a good thing to be able to tout and, and get your value across as a department. Yeah, I, can I, I just want to applaud you for that because I think yes. that is so <laughs> on point and so necessary right now. It's just, uh, th there's, it's really a time where we need innovators in the in-house legal community um, for two, at least two really important reasons. One is there's going to be efficiency mandates coming down from the C-suite, no matter what, in many, many industries. In some, it's going to be huge and others it's going to be substantial but we're all going to be subject to this so why would you crouch and defensively when it's going to happen anyway right so be proactive step up and innovate in big ways because this is the time to do it and but also remember the small ways you don't want to be the person who can't get their video working you don't want to be the person that you know isn't there a document right <laughs> So if you need training to be tech savvy, get it. That is one of the things I'm sitting down with law firm lawyers to do because they're looking like idiots in front of their clients when they can't share a document and they can't seamlessly use Zoom to hold a meeting. And right. so I'm getting called by, by CEO clients because they're like, can you help my outside law firm? <laughs> they, they can't get this together. So that is one of the things that I've worked on all week this week. Um, <laughs> which is why I know the IT guys are working hard. Right. And I think also we can come out stronger from this, right? Your yeah. le legal department, this is horrible, but we have to look for silver linings. And as leaders, we have to emerge stronger. And yeah. if you innovate now, when there's a mandate to innovate anyway, this is the time to do it, right? You, it, I think it's kind of this once in a lifetime opportunity to bring real innovation to your department. Yeah. And, there's a lot of innovative GCs out there who've wanted to do this kind of thing for a long time, but it's hard to muster the internal will to make that happen. He, you're now handed a mandate to do this. So lead from the front. I, so anyway, I just wanted to, I really yeah. liked what you said and I wanted to just pause and just, you know, reiterate and, and elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah. You know what I liken this to no one wants to put in place infrastructure until they have litigation that shows that their infrastructure doesn't support what they need. So litigation is usually a inflection point that, that makes changes in a legal department. So that's when compliance measures get put in, that's when allocation of dollars get put to, to compliance or um, databases for contract management or some other system that wasn't in place or they couldn't get the dollars allocated for it before or they didn't have IT support or whatever the reason or excuse or whatever it was, there's usually something that causes it to, to rise to the top and become a priority. And it's usually litigation that shows all those warts and seams. <laughs> right. Now it's working from home is showing all those warts and seams that you have in your department. And now you have a chance to go, oh, we can fix that and be proactive about it. I think the other thing, and I'll, I'll say some more about this a little bit later, is ask your people what they think, because they're going to have ideas on how to solve this. You know, your millennials, your lawyers who are 27 or 30, they're going to have very different ideas than you if you've been practicing for 20 years. So I think that's the other thing not to forget in all this equation is ask your people and see what they want and what they want to put in place. Right. And you can spot emerging leaders among your staff too. So that's an, it's a good time to not only emerge as a leader yourself, but to start to watch the potential future stars and, and, yeah. and support them. So let me actually address the myth versus reality. So the myth is that we have a beautiful home office and it's all secure and our door closes and locks and we don't get interrupted. And the reality is people are working all over their house, kitchen table, they got to wash the kids. If your kids are home, I mean, my kids are all college age and that's my son, you know, working on his cooking skills. 
um, that my kids are all home from college because they can't be there any longer. Um, if you're young children, I mean, I, the women who have toddlers right now, are, they're, they're turning gray is what's happening. Um, they, they are just trying to keep everything together. They're hanging on by a thread. And if you have a single mom in your department, let me tell you, you need to give extra love and attention to that woman <laughs> because it, it, there is nothing harder. And so I think that you can get all your equipment and everything right, but if you, you, are, you have a spouse working at home, you have two or three kids working at home, it is just a different world. And I think acknowledging that the reality is a little bit different than what we want in an ideal world, um, that's really important. The public versus private space, the, the do not disturb. Um, one of my friends is using that sign on her door. She's got five kids at home from, from I think age 12 to, to 20. And so that's the sign she uses on her door that says, I'm on a call, don't disturb me unless the house is burning down. So that's kind of what she put in place at her house. Um, are you alone? Are you working at home? Cause, cause you, <laughs> uh, or do you have five people in the house? Is it quiet or is it chaotic? So I just want to look at what the ideal, you know, myth of what's working at home versus what the reality is. And I think just acknowledging that for each of your people is really important. Um, when I had six people, so my kids were, were <laughs> home, moved back in with us last fall. My brother was staying with us for three weeks six people in a 1400 square foot house, there was no private space. I had to take, if I had a sensitive call, I had to go into my, sit in my car in my driveway to have that call, you know, not be overheard by other people. So it's not that changed from what's going on now and having everybody home or all in one space. And you have, you know, um, multiple generations in houses because you have, have, um, yeah, the, or gosh, the childcare situation, just not even having that, together is caused a, a big hiccup in everybody's, you know, day-to-day -day work lives. So I just think acknowledging that the, the chaos is what's going on is really important. Um, can you go to the next one? Sure. Um, I, I did want to unmute briefly and see if anyone had any questions at this point, if that works for you, uh, because we're about halfway through the, um, the hour. So um, I'm just going to unmute everyone and see, does anyone have a question as of now? Feel free to speak up and then I'll, I'll re-mute everybody just to avoid the background noise. Nope. Okay. All right. I'm going to mute all again, Sonia. Then you, yep. Unmute yourself. Just a minute. Let me just unmute again because there we go. So just unmute yourself and then we'll continue. Talking to myself again. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> At least I like what I hear. Um, Working from home, there's no secret. There's tons of articles out there. There's tons of best practices out there of what that looks like and working from home and making it a success. So these are all the things. You have a routine, you dress for work, just as if you were going into the office, you have a regular stable schedule that you stick to. Um, you communicate your expectations and priorities, um, over communicate, you have good boundaries between work and home. Um, you prioritize self-care and you keep movement and exercise as part of your regular routine. There's nothing that's a secret in this about these best practices. And people who've worked remotely for a long time have these five things down. But the reality that we're in right now is every day is different, okay? And it's different for everybody. So different schedules, different routine. Um, did your assignments arrive for your kids, you know, that are five, your, you, your spouse, you know, kids are all competing interests and priorities. I am seeing, I'm talking people off the, the ledge because they're having arguments with their spouse over whose job is more important and who's taking priority on a daily or hourly basis in most households with, you know, dual income earners and kids because, Whose turn is it to do something, whether it's cook, clean, take care of the kids, have the Zoom meeting, be on a private call. Um, now, something as simple as grocery shopping is a risk assessment and anxiety ridden. So, so we don't have the ideal and we, it's very hard to get to that ideal of those five things and controlling them. So the more we can get people on the spectrum to, to best practices on those five things, the better and more stable they're going to be. And the more they're going to go back to the effective and productive side of the spectrum. But right now we're on the Maslow's hierarchy and we are on the bottom of it with shelter and food. Survival. <laughs> yeah. 
By the way, on, on the note of shopping, just as a personal note, I definitely rec I'm the designated shopper. So, you know, whatever, I guess that's the opposite of the designated survivor in, a, in this grim environment. But anyway, uh, I'm the guy that goes out and I really recommend if you're that person, just go there when the store opens. It's so much better. I mean, get what it, whatever the opening hour is, some of those have changed, but just yeah. Like the drugstore opens at nine. That's when I go. I see if there's yeah. toilet paper. I see if there's paper towels, <laughs> you know, Advil, whatever, whatever people need. And so get a list. We have a list right on the kitchen table. People yeah. write what they need. I go to the store every few days, right when it opens. I'm one of like yeah. three people in the whole place. It's so much better. So anyway. Yeah. But we are at the bottom of that hierarchy. And what we're trying to do is get mm. people to the next level. So helping your team become stable and recognizing that their work is not going to happen in some nice nine to five world. It's just not. And, and the funny, if you look carefully at the graphic I included here, is work times. <laughs> okay. That is the reality of what's happening. I mean, this is a funny, but it's actually what's happening with a lot of people. Um, it's just, can we get people to a safe and stable routine with clearer boundaries between you know, home and work? It's going to be really hard to do that right now. But it gives us an opportunity to test the worst case scenario. So if you're doing planning for the future, this is the worst case scenario that you're testing. <laughs> so if you've got someone who can work and be productive in this environment, they are worth their weight in gold because they are the ones that can truly manage through a crisis. Yep. And, and I love that dress for work. Wear what you'd wear if on a video call. Wear like a collared shirt, if, if, you know, or some equivalent business wear because Think about the meeting, the virtual meeting you have. I think you should wear the same thing you'd wear to the actual meeting. Maybe not a suit and tie if that's what you wear to work, but you know, uh, you wouldn't. You don't want to wear something that you'd feel uncomfortable sitting in an actual business meeting wearing. I think. Yeah, I, I think just that. saw a court notice that says you can't wear t-shirts in court. Don't wear them on a video court call yeah. either or hats or whatever. It was like, dress professionally. You're still a lawyer and you're still presenting in court. It just happens to be by video. Yeah. So yeah, keep, keep that in mind. Go ahead and go to the next one. Oh, I think Sorry. we had a question. No, I was saying these are such fundamental things because I guess because I worked with global teams, we were, we were used to doing this and I'm surprised that some people don't think about that. Because mm -hmm. I think it, this is kind of some, of the, and, and also what I would say is, and I, and I know that this is not the case for everyone, but because I had to do it in the past, you start setting boundaries, like you said, that's so mm -hmm. important. So my kids know whether they should come in or not, if they know I'm on a call, then yeah. they, they will not come in. And I guess it helps that the kids are the age that you can actually tell them if they were younger. That's not always the case, as we know from the video from the guy who was on yeah. BBC, where his kids walked in because they were too young to know any better. <laughs> Yeah. But but you're right, and it's it's a hard time, and it's challenging, and then because also we're not allowed to go out and get out too much of our energy except work out a little bit, etc. I think there's that sort of it it starts building up. It's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. So go to the next slide, Chris. This is really to do your assessment. How are you working from home? And then really take a frank and honest assessment of do you really know how your team is doing working from home? Who has kids at home? Did all their college age kids come back? Did they have to bring in a relative? You know, who are they taking care of? Not just themselves. So the, this is really about you and your team. How are you doing? If you're having trouble working at home and staying focused, how is your team doing? Are they able to work you know, effectively? Or are they just on the bottom of that hierarchy still just trying to get everybody fed and clothed and asleep and still alive the next day? Um, because that's what's going on. I, I'm part of a law mama's group on Facebook and it's 12,000 women lawyers who are mothers. And I did a survey on there and I would say about a quarter of them. I, I asked what is working because people were complaining about what's not working and you know, kids watching video, you know, TV time, screen time all the time. So I said, what is working? And basically people are establishing new routines. So they're shifting their schedules. Um, they are shifting schedules with their kids so that they'll have meal times and then they'll have two hours of work while everybody's doing schoolwork or, or something or nap time. So the schedule shifting is, is what's happening. Um, there's jockeying with the spouses to figure out who's, who's priority for what call, you know, can be interrupted or not interrupted. There's um, basically change in communication. 
So communicating more, communicating on a daily, hourly basis. There's respect in terms of playing to each other's strengths. And then I would say the last two are the most important are the compassion and grace. And I'll talk about this more in just a second of giving yourself a break. You can't expect productivity of working from home one to two days a week out of what's happening now. So give yourself a little grace. And I think changed or different or lowered expectations of how, how much work and when it's getting done um, is the other thing that's happening. Can you go down to the next slide, Chris? Sonia, what have you found in terms of uh, people being productive at home and uh, being able to get more or less work done because there are more distractions? You know, the, the, you know have, have you noticed any kind of uh, uh, trends as, as far as that? Or, you know, or, or can people be as productive from home as from an office uh, or? I think in an ideal situation where everyone is stable and feels safe, so I'm gonna to go to the emotional chaos versus stability here and answer your question that way. As long as people feel emotionally um, stable and, and that they can handle it, then their work productivity is just the same as if in, they were in the office and maybe even better. So people who are schedule shifting and I have uh, a couple people who like sleep, get up and they work like from five to 8 a.m. And in that quiet time when everyone's still asleep, they are super and amazingly productive. When chaos hits and the two kids wake up at eight, my kids never slept till eight, so I don't know how this would have worked in my house. I would have been working from like 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. when my first kid would wake up. Um, but then they have a routine where she stops working, they have breakfast together, they set the schedule and expectations for the day. She actually uses a whiteboard, so she has everybody's schedule of who's doing what. I have another mom who's got it, you know, printed out in columns for each kid and in a, you know, those plastic sleeves that they can write on with a dry erase marker. So people are just finding ways to communicate with their family and kids and coworkers of here's the time I'm available. This is why um, setting priorities is super important and communicating when something needs to be done because if someone's trying to get work done in that chaotic setting, they're not going to be able to say, oh, my turnaround time is half an hour. Because if you're dealing with a kid who's crying or whatever, you can't concentrate and have that same level of productivity. So I would say the people that are making it work have come up with shifted schedules with their spouse or they have some you know smaller increments of time where they're more productive um you know and it tends to be the beginning and ends of the day very rarely in the middle so um, can i just add one thing what you just said is because actually if you think about it i go into the city and i live in the suburbs my commute time is three hours. So I'm actually saving those three hours, which I can now put to productive use. Yeah. And I don't think enough of us are talking about that because not just the time gone, but it's also physically exhausting when you're in public transport, et cetera. You know, it's yeah. not like it's, it's smooth, even if you're driving. Yeah. I mean, the traffic is so much. So in some ways, being able to not have to worry about sitting in traffic and doing that actually takes away that one pressure yeah. So I think not enough people are saying that this is actually making us so much more productive because it's giving me more time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think people are putting back in the physical activity and movement. So they're yeah. outside or they're finding some other routine inside. So I think for people who don't have kids at home, that that is truly um, more productive time. Hey, um, think, so also, so even yeah. if you do have kids, can I just add one thing? Because I can say this because I remember when I would come back from work by 7.30 in the evening, yeah. I left at like 6 o'clock or 6.30 in the morning. You barely saw your kids and you were exhausted by the time you came, but the kids are kids, so they wanted attention. Yeah. So in some you. ways, it, this is almost easier. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have to do this. As, speaking of time management, we're rapidly yeah. running out of time and we're only about halfway through the uh, deck. So I, yeah. we, uh, so maybe, Sonia, I hate to do this, but maybe just touch on some of the main points that you have remaining. And yeah. then what we'll do is we'll post this video as well as the full slide deck to the In the House website, which is at www.inthehouse.org so people can look through the whole deck. But unfortunately, we're running low on time at this point and we it's need to- discussion because it's so, 
there's so many issues. It is. And the questions are great and the comments are great, but unfortunately we're rapidly running out of time. Well, the good news is we've talked about almost everything on here. So oh, good. The, the important part here, and, and I have a couple pieces of advice here. You have to be a human being first. And remember people first, that your team is, you know, is a team of people. So if they have anxiety issues because their spouse is a first responder, then it's going to be harder for them to be productive. So just, just kind of do an assessment of where people are on this. And if you guys are talking about, you know, if you're on the layoffs and furloughs versus business as usual, you're going to have a different set of issues. But if you're on the business as usual and everyone's, you know, crazy trying to keep their head above water, then that's a different set of issues. So I just think do a, do an assessment of where you are and where your people are in this and remember to be, you know, human first and then show compassion and grace wherever possible because people will appreciate it um, more than you know. And then the last part of this is staying connected and we're going to go to the next slide. People are being creative about how they're connecting with each other and I would say like we did at the beginning of this meeting reserve some time to stay connected with people. So we just had some chit chat and I know some of you are thinking oh if you know, who has time for chit chat? We have to get this all this work done. Um, it's the chit chat and the connection that bind us together and build rapport and lasting relationships. And that builds the respect and the, and the willingness to, to perform at higher levels. So I would say just a few ideas and, and you're gonna laugh, but the one I put in there about being creative and a pampered chef party, I'm in one group and we meet every day at five o'clock and people are like, okay, we need some, something else. And so we've shared recipes, we've shared uh, other things. And yesterday it came up of, okay, we're doing all this cooking. I realized how ill-equipped my kitchen is. You know, we need to do something. And so somebody offered to do a pampered chef party. So be creative and ask people, share good news, you know, ask for suggestions from your team, but, you know, do something. What, what is a pampered chef party? It's, kitchen gadgets and stuff and you, it's like a merry it's like tupperware party but it's kitchen gadgets and stuff so that that was one thing that came out of it and and this was men and women so it was kind of like yes we we all need help in the kitchen because <laughs> we're captive <laughs> so that was one interesting thing go one more slide down chris please sure. so this is really the crux of everything is the communication and um i think it's important to have State and articulate it. And this goes back to our whole discussion about being proactive. State what your department goals and purposes are. And I'm guessing they have changed <laughs> now. Um, and, and have a discussion about that. And then you can set expectations and priorities according to that and, and what needs to get done. And don't be afraid to have shifting priorities um, and get that across in daily huddles. You know, you can meet for 15 minutes in the morning just to get everyone on the same page. You can have check-ins, you know, whether you're doing it one-to-one -one or whether you're doing a team check-in. Um, just recognize that, that there are new norms and that you may need to set ground rules of everyone comes, dress professionally, everyone uses video, everyone contributes. I mean, it's easy to have your video off and not contribute to the meeting. And as a leader, you need to draw people in to communicate as if you were in a live meeting where the person that's silent all the time, like I like to talk, so I'm talking in meetings, but um, for the person like my husband who would never talk in a meeting, you have to draw out their thoughts and concerns. So it's no different on a video meeting. So those norms and how you want to communicate as a team are really important. And we already talked about being a leader and being proactive. And then yep. I would say it's, it's not all gloom and doom. People really are hankering for positive information and good information. They want their leaders to be positive. They are looking for encouragement and things they can control um, to stay out of that chaos land and instability. Right. They're looking at, at things and they want to make a contribution. So keep that in mind. You will have people step up and do things for you that you didn't think would happen with people on your team. So just, you know, be open to that. The next slide on accountability, you know, this is, I can't, <laughs> I can't tell you how important it is to stay out of the trap of the out of sight, out of mind with your team. So being closely connected is really important and having that stated goal is really important to unify everyone. So 
I would say that leaders lead, and Chris, you said leaders lead from the front, and so articulating and showing a context for why your department's doing what they're doing and why each person is doing what they're doing, that's what they need from you as a leader. Um, they don't need a leadership void. They start making up their own stories about what's going on. So <laughs> you wanna uh, avoid that. And I think the other thing is be present whether it's by phone or Zoom or whatever tool you use with your team, I think uh, checking in with them. And then if you start to see issues, address it early and often because <laughs> you don't want it to fester and have someone quit. I'm seeing two things happen. People are, uh, people are like, oh, I love my job, I love my department, or like, oh my God, I don't wanna work another minute for this person. When this is all over, I'm quitting and finding a new job. So <laughs> they're just biding their time. So you don't wanna be in that latter category. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I think we have to wrap very soon. We usually go to 50 and we're at 55. So I apologize, but this has been amazing content. I love what you've said. I think it's really valuable. I think we've covered everything. If you Fantastic. want to go one more slide down to what's not working. Okay. I just want to wrap up by saying we talked about communication already. We talked about having compassion and grace. If things are not working, I would say reprioritize. Um, and then get things back on track because it's tough right now. It really is. And then if you go one more slide down, Chris, yep. I would say we chatted a little bit about being strategic and proactive versus being reactive and catch as catch can. What's going to be here for the new normal is how do you want to control costs with working from home or using technology wisely or differently? And then can you retool any of your processes and procedures for the future? Can you do it now so that you come out looking like a hero and controlling your budget and doing more with less because that's what we're going to have to do. Um, and if you go to the last slide, people can have my contact information. Great. Excellent. So thank you so much, Sonia. I think this is fantastic um, advice. Um, uh, stepping up as a leader. Um, I love what you said about being a hero because it, it's it's actually not too corny in a time like this to step up. I mean, in disasters, heroes do emerge. It's a fact. Um, and I think I love what you said about the governors. Look at the various governors, pick the one that you think represents the best response to this crisis and model your behavior on their approach. Um, yeah. And I, I definitely, I, I agree with your comments that it's the people that overshare information are are more visible than not so like governor cuomo in my state is there every day at the same time and and that is really important stuff and you know it's the, comforting same time every day here exactly a message. he's not giving you any new information he's still making a statement he's still showing up as a leader yep he's showing up as authentic of i'm doing the best i can with the information i have um, you know, just, you know, stepping in, into actually leading people. Yeah. And we in the risk management business and in the talking business, right. The lawyers are basically paid for their uh, verb, you know, the, yeah. the, the analysis that they provide. Uh, but you can't be so focused on risk that you forget to be out front because you can't be a leader. You can't be a zero risk leader. You yeah. have to put yourself out there. And that's really so important in this, particularly in this time. So yeah. And I just want to leave with the last thought of we don't know what the new normal is going to be, but you have a really amazing opportunity to shape what that looks like for you and your employees and your department and hopefully the company. Yes, I, I so agree with all that. I also think that one thing that's come through in the last few weeks of the, this discussion that we have every Friday at noon is that many, many people, many, many GCs and other in-house counsel believe that things will not fully go back, right? Yeah. The C-suite's going to see cost savings that happen from this work yeah. from home thing. And the shareholders will put pressure on the C-suite and the C-suite will put pressure on the business units to keep some of those cost savings, right? Either out of necessity or out of, if you're in a good business, a strong business, profit taking. Either way, things, it's almost, in, I think in a capitalist system, it's going to be almost impossible for everyone to go back to exactly the way things were. That's my, I mean, that's my analysis, but I think, you know, smarter people than, than me have, have made similar observations. So, so thank you again. We're here every, so Sonia Siegler, thank you so much. Uh, David Slater, the co-host of 
GC Casual Fridays. We're here every Friday at noon Eastern time. So every week that's not a holiday. Um, and so please join us in the future. Uh, this presentation, both audio, video, and slides will be at uh, www.inthehouse.org probably tomorrow. So if you need to share it with someone, that's where you can find the link. You can always find me, Chris, at inthehouse.org. And um, I just want to thank everybody for your participation and for all the great uh, questions. So I will uh, just thank everybody and I'll turn the video off and I can, um, I can stay around for a few minutes afterwards. But thanks everybody uh, and hope to see you next week for the next uh, GC Casual Friday.